Hey everybody and welcome to the Pedal Zone and welcome to Juan Alderete. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you, you pronounce mine better than Nick's band. Uh, yes, Alderete is correct. Um, I did the, the correct Spanish role. Yes, you know what? I, I'd have to say being here in Denmark, it's probably the the craziest sounding language to me. I mean, I've, you know, I've traveled all over Europe and, you know, Sweden's different, obviously, German, whatever. But when you get here, you really get this sense that, man, this language is, I don't pick up one word. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's a weird, mushy mess. I, I think it's pretty, it's pretty musical to me. Like, I, when, you know, when they're on the, on the airplane telling you what to do or whatever it just it just has like a like it's very rhythmic to me it sounds that way to me i don't know so we have a musical language eh? yeah let's do this <laughs> no but the reason why you're here is that you've been going through europe with your buddy nick yes uh doing some earthquaker clinics and yes. you started out in frankfurt at Messe. yeah yeah I, I did that for earthquaker for four days um couple times a day it, 30 minutes is nothing you know i've been doing clinics for earthquaker for five years or something like that um easily and um you know i go all over the world i've been i've done clinics for them in japan i've done them in mexico canada europe <clears throat> and so you know doing 30 minutes was nothing. So like doing two hours or three hours or four hours, that's a lot of work. Cause you know, nobody, I mean, the only way you could do something like that is if you were either an unbelievable musician or you had a bunch of pedals. Cause I run out of ideas. Yeah, I'm, I, I know I'm not the best people. musician. No. And so I can, I can get away with it because I, you know, I have pedals in front of me so I can extend my, extend ideas. But you know, yeah, it's sometimes I'm like, you know, if, it, if it's if it's like with the first one we did in Germany, I think it went four hours, and I was like looking at Nick going, "I have no more ideas, man." I didn't miss it. Four no, hours? no, no, no. It was like the first clinic we did at a music store. I'm oh, sorry. yeah, yeah, and it and it was in Freibach, I think, or something like that in yeah. Germany, and yeah, they were just like, just keep playing, and you know, people walk in and out, and it's like. By the third hour mark, I was going, I'm, I'm completely out of ideas, you know, let alone like, I, I know I have like 15 pedals, but it's still limiting when you have to play four hours. You know? Even Bruce Springsteen would be out of stamina. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think so. So anyway, yeah, so we, we did that. And then um, we did uh, Birmingham yesterday, which was awesome. I knew it was going to be because like, you know, you know, fans or kids or whatever, you know, musicians are really good with social media. And I had at least 15, 20 kids hit me saying they were going to come. So I figured, well, 20 is going to be great. And then it ended up being 70 and they, we couldn't fit everybody in the room. So it was awesome. Even if it was, if it was a, a holiday and all that, I just think that in the bigger cities like Birmingham or London or whatever, I mean, I've done them in London. It was the same thing. It was packed people standing outside the store watching. So it really is this excitement for sound. You know, yeah. people are really starving and and want to. And you know, Earthquaker is the hippest one, and they're the they are the the trendsetters, they're the leaders of the boutique craziness. Um, you know, Digitech for a while was really, you know, in the '90s were really doing some amazing yeah. things. That whammy pedal. There's so many pedals I could go on. Well, Earthquaker's that, and I think Earthquaker will be, you know, as big as any of those big ones like like Digitech or MXR or Boss, they'll, they'll be that big because it's finally getting to the mainstream. So you find people who, I mean, I had kids yesterday who said I only own one pedal, you know, and I'm thinking about getting an earthquake and I forget what that's like because I own 500 pedals. So, you know, to me it's like, oh, that's right. You got to start somewhere and that's a big decision when you make that decision to commit to a pedal. Like, what one should I get? There's so many. And so, you know, they usually ask, what do you recommend? And I'm like, a chorus. I almost always start with chorus because it sounds great on guitar or mm -hmm. bass and you'll use it in recording. Uh, you know, you can use it on your voice, you know, whatever. And so, you know, I, I, I just, always tell the kids yeah jump in there and then from there you should obviously get a distortion or whatever yeah. you know i mean i guess kids are always the thing is you can make your amp distort so you know you don't really necessarily need a distortion in the beginning you know just distort your amp and have a chorus or whatever but anyway but i'm getting off track yeah, but yeah the reason why i really dick earthquaker you no know, 
as a company, they consist of some awesome people, but the products, you know, they just span such a wide tonal gamut, you know, that you can get subtle, subtle tones, but you can also get completely crazy tones. Yeah. So in that way, when you get one of their pedals, you know, you're, you're set for years right. just finding sounds. I mean, it's endless, like what, how you use it. I mean, I think something like the Raymo machine will give me things to do for the rest of the time I own it. You know, it's <clears throat> sometimes I get a setting and I have to take a photo of it. So I go, I've never gotten that sound. And again, the thing with like a lot of pedals too is that depending on your instrument. So if I'm playing flat wound bass through the Rainbow Machine, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get different results as if I got a you know like a short scale round wound sound going or if i have a, like a very mid-rangey bass sound going you know it's, it's all these things are different so then you, that's a whole nother avenue it's not just like you know, i think guitar gets away with it more where you can just plug in your average guitar and you'll get a lot of sound but bass is so different because you're using flat wounds you're using tape wounds you're using round wounds you have short scale basses you have long scale bass five string basses fretless bass so there's all this so all you know that's Every one of those that I just named sound different with the rainbow machine. So there's, it's just like, it's just this little dude sitting there going, I have infinite amount of sound for you. So, you know, when I'm trying to get creative, I, that's one of the first ones I'll go grab is just to see like, where am I going today with this guy, you know? And one thing that I've been thinking about with, with you as, as a bass player and excuse my stereotypical view of bass players, but it tends to be a bit more conservative when it comes to effects. Right. It's usually more bass directly into amp, perhaps a distortion panel. Sure. How did you get so much into effects? You know, what triggered you? I think, I think just, you know, bands in the 90s. Um, I mean, effects obviously been used for a long time, since you know, 50s, 60s, you know, people have been trying to create things, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, but I think in the 90s, a lot of bands that I was listening uh, that I was listening to were were doing crazy sounds. You know, there was a very great label in America called Touch and Go, and they had a lot of great bands. And I'd listen to these things, and I'd go, "Where are these sounds coming from? It doesn't sound like, you know, Led Zeppelin bass sounds, and it doesn't sound like or whatever." And you know, so I started looking into it, and then you just find bands like Brainiac or Jesus Lizard, Girls Against Boys. There's, you know, their their bass sounds weren't traditional. So then I went, "I'm into this," and so I started buying pedals, and you know, just getting deep into it and developed it myself. I mean, I, I think I recorded my Bato Negro record, which is pretty wild. It's just like me. And like at that time I had like 40 or 50 pedals and then I just made a record of just me and a drummer. And I just went crazy on effects. And I think I did that. I think I cut that around 97, 98. So I think that I still haven't done anything that wild. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to just go in with a drummer and act like, I'm Hendrix on bass. Yeah. Um, but um, just to think, I guess, so, you know, maybe, I don't know, six, eight years before that, I started buying, really getting into buying pedals. So, yeah, early 90s, I started getting into it. And then, you know, it just keeps going and growing. And obviously, getting in a band like Mars Volta, you know, I... Yeah, with a dude like Omar. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when I met him, I didn't, I didn't know... I didn't, I didn't have anything to go by. I mean, there wasn't even a lot of information. They're, they're, they're pretty, like, they don't do tons of press or whatever. And so I didn't know much about it. So when I met him, I, you know, I had, like, at that time, I don't know, 60 pedals or something. And I said, hey, man, I got a lot of pedals. And he goes, oh, okay. And I go, yeah, if you ever want hired. No, but I just said, I just said, if you want to use any, you know, you know, I got a ton of them. And he goes, okay, cool. And he never said anything. He was very, like, you know, nonchalant about it. And then when I finally went to go record with him, I found that he had like three, 400 pedals and he didn't say anything to me. And I was like, oh, oh I felt like such an idiot. I'm like, man, he, this dude's already so deep into it that I, and he had, you know, great pedals. He had, he, you know, he would go into those used shops that used to be on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood and he would just buy tons of vintage pedals, really, really great ones. And, you know, he always had like really cool electroharmonics, uh, memory mans, like the early ones with the, you know, yeah. vibrato or even before that. And, you know, he had really great delays and stuff. So not even just, that just kind of got me into it more. And plus getting into that band, um, you know, it allowed me to have access to companies that get pedals, you know, so like, mm -hmm. 
you know, Digitech immediately was on, MXR was immediately on. So in the beginning, I used to have a lot of Digitech at MXR because that's who gave me pedals and then stuff that I bought. And then, you know, it wasn't really, I think, until 2010 that maybe nine or 10. And when I got in contact with Jamie at Earthquaker and it was just him soldering himself in his basement yeah. and so i think like i was one of the it's grown fast yeah and you know i i kind of grew with them you know like they you know they asked me to do be their demo guy at nam you know for the first couple of years i think they were there the year before i met them and then for two years after that i did i was their you know, only dude who 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 did demos for them at yeah. NAM, and then and then they you know started bringing more people in and now you know last year was damn it was just like i don't know there was a ton of people playing but it was really nice to be like in that with them you know like i was in the trenches with them so yeah. to speak and it, and really it's like the i think the big reason why obviously creativity of jamie and then you have his wife julie who is a brilliant business mind and the other thing is too, people don't know this, but they actually had a record label in the nineties. Jamie was in a band called Party of Helicopters. Mm -hmm. And I think they started a label, Julie and Jamie did, and it actually went through GSO, which is what uh uh Mars Volta Vinyl went through and oh, all okay. the Omar solo records, my band Big Sur went through that. Yeah. Well, we uh GSO helped distribute uh, their label at one point. So it's all the same kind of family. A lot of our friends slept on their floors because book, Julie would book shows in Akron. So, you know, bands would sleep on her floor. So this isn't just like, it's just a pedal company. Some dude who was always dreamt of being, you know, he's a musician. He did exactly what we did. And Julie was in it with them, you know, with them, like, you know, it's all that underground network, but to see the underground network get as big as they are is, you know, man, I just get so choked up, but it's like literally like they, they deserve it. Yeah. They totally deserve it. Oh, they're good people. Yeah. Um, another thing I've been thinking about as your role as a bass player and with effects, how, how do you approach uh, your role and using effects in the different bands you've been in? You know, it must have been different from Razor X to Mars Volta, where Omar is already doing a lot of stuff. Razor X, there's a lot of guitar action as well. And then to the bands where you're more in focus, uh, Big Sur and right. your latest outing, what is it? Helios Halo Orbit? Orbit. Ha Halo Orbit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with, with um, Razor X, like in the, in the first round of it, I just used like chorus and compressor. Compressor yeah. just so I could pop the harmonics because that's what we all did back in the day. Yeah. Every 80s bass player had chorus. I had a TC Electronics chorus. Hey. <laughs> and um, so then uh, after that, uh, when in the 90s is when I, I really got in, I joined a band called Pet. It was um, this awesome band. Actually, Tyler Bates, the guitar player and leader of that band, he um, he did the music for 300, the movie 300, yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. That's Tyler Bates. Yeah, he's a great musician. So I joined that band. He was already into effects too, and I started getting way more into you know, music that I felt more comfortable with. Racer X was never my music. It was always their music and I could rip on it. Yeah. But it was, I wasn't a metal dude. And so I, I went back to the music that I was into and Pet was more along the lines of that. And I also, I was in a band called Distortion Felix, which was real kind of like Jesus and Mary Chain, Pixies kind of band. And I played Distorted the whole time. So I had either micro synth or, or you know, like a big Russian so tech fuzz um so i was way into that and then it just kept getting you know again like from there i that those bands i had specific sounds for and then of course when i went to mars volta it was just like you know go crazy you know there's certain things you just don't like you know we had the widow which was like that was francis to me was the first record i made i got to make with mars volta and that's just straight fretless and then but you have some other stuff on there. There's ring mod. There's you know micro synth. There's you know big fuzz sounds. There's tremolo cuts. Um, and then as the band progressed, I just got crazier and crazier. And you know, next thing you know, I had ring mods all over the record. I had vibratos, and you know, there's a lot on there. And a lot of times too, you don't really know what making what sound but i know myself like there's a lot of sounds on there that you probably wouldn't know or bass 
you know. No, yeah, when well, you were thinking yeah. it would be synth or perhaps Omar right. going crazy. With right, and so a lot of times too live, like live yeah. people would think certain things, like all, most of the stuff was, that was played in between songs was pretty much Omar and me. I mean, you'd hear like Ike Twinkle Keys and, and Marcel would be doing, which would be obviously some kind of synth stuff or something or maybe percussion, but Omar would usually loop something because he was always like getting ready for the next song or whatever. And I would just be on, up there just doing weird stuff. That's where I could really go out. Mm -hmm. And so I would do crazy ring mod stuff with, you know, with the expression pedal or, or just micro synth or, you know, whammy pedal or whatever. And I would just, just got nuttier and nuttier as it went. I mean, at the I think at the biggest, we were, I had like four, like three foot pedal boards. And no I, way. I think it was like a four, I think I had like 40 pedals at one time. So it was like, I had a three foot, three and a half foot board facing the drummer, another three foot facing the audience, another three foot behind me. And then I had another one on top of my bass amp. Any of the ones I could, you know, mess with with my hands. So like delays or flangers or something like that, I would have up on the end so I could just go to it. And I had a switching system at the base of the rig. So it was like, that was when it was just ridiculous. Like I I think, I think uh, I was like 3000 pounds of the cartridge that would go out <laughs> to these shows. Cause I had like all the pedal boards. I'd travel with six, seven bases. I had two SVT cabinets, three heads. Um, you know, backup speakers because I would, you know, just in case I blew anything. So I had, the, I had, I was more weight than the drums. I don't think that'll ever happen again in my life. You know, it will never happen again in my life. But you know, I, I, I definitely got to live it. So it was pretty fun, awesome. When I spoke to Nick, the way that he thinks effects, like he uses them very rhythmically, and creates these stuttery glitches. He, he told me that he, he almost thinks like a drummer at yeah. times. Uh, how how do you think about effects? How do you use utilize them? Is it to make you make it sound bigger or? I think both. I think I do a little what Nick does because mine's not so much from like you know the, the electronic music he listens to. I mean I do love that music and I do listen to it, but mine comes more from hip hop, you know, because hip hop would loop stuff and so and they, the stuff would pop in and out like especially like <clears throat> the stuff that I really like like early public enemy dr dre stuff or whatever there's always some weird kind of thing that would get looped and so i would i would you know that kind of influenced me um the the search for low end has always come from hip-hop in 808 i i all the way to like early 90s like i wanted my bass to sound like an 808 and that's where 808 that's where i first heard 808 was in hip-hop and i would hear like you know, like the hood cars in, you know, where I live in Los Angeles, whether it was low riders or just whatever, you would hear those dudes come down the street and you'd go, what? And it would just be like, and I was like, I want my bass to sound like that. Yeah. So I was on a search from the early nineties to, to get my bass to sound like that. And so it's, oh, like I said, it comes from hip hop and <clears throat> it didn't come from any other band. I mean, the distortion stuff comes from the nineties bands, but definitely any of the low end stuff is, definitely hip-hop and so you know it doesn't yeah i mean when you're trying to like come up with your own thing because i've always been kind of driven with that like i didn't want to sound like anybody else i've never played i've never plugged into a sans amp never because everybody uses them and i was like you know i'm just like a still like a dumb kid i'm like well if everybody's gonna do that i'm gonna do something else so i use the boss cs2 compressor you know i, I get kids who buy them and they're they're really great pedals they're noisy but they're great but I just won't use a Sans amp. I mean, I would now, but like I, when I was coming up, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. But it's just that I've always tried to look for something different. And I, I can't even say any bass player when it comes to sound was a real influence on me. I think, um, you know, The Edge, I loved him. I thought he got great sounds. Van Halen, um, you know, bass players didn't go crazy. Nope. Mick Karn was like a fretless player that I really liked and his approach to bass was really bizarre. He nobody sounds like him. But everybody else was had the tradition stuff and that influenced a different side of me. But sound wise, I don't think so. I don't think anybody it was well, there was no real bass players that I was like going, Oh, I wanna you know, maybe just like the eighties chorus out bass like in the cure or something, but that would be it. So that kind of leads me to my next question with your YouTube channel, Pedals mm -hmm. and Effects, which is awesome by the way, check it out. Did you try to kind of change the way 
basis basis should look at effects. No, I just know? literally was completely driven that I hated every YouTube channel. I was like, I <laughs> I want to go. I'd go. God, I wonder what that pedal sounds like. Should I check it out? And then I'd get there, and there'd be some wanker, you know, playing like you know blues licks through yeah. a, a pedal that had so much more potential. Yeah. Or like you know the other thing that drives me crazy is like like when people get walls of sound. Like I like you know if they're trying to do shoegaze or something like that. It's like that's one of the easiest things in the world to do. Like look into the pedal for something else in that, but that is, that's so easy. So, you know what I mean? So I was just like, I can't, I, I gotta do something. I gotta do something for the weirdos like me. Yeah. And so I, I just started it. And, and that was really, wasn't even thinking like, I wanna help. I mean, I know I said that in the beginning, but it wasn't really, to be honest, it wasn't even about for bass players. It was literally like, I'm gonna try to start something so people have a resource to go to for, you know, outside thinking or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, sound thinking that wasn't like, you know, John Mayer blues licks, you know, dot com or something, you know, like <laughs> I, I'm not I, I, you know, I'm not that I don't listen to music like that. I, I love Hendrix. And I love Stevie Ray Vaughan, all that stuff. But yeah, no, but it's true. You know, yeah. YouTube was completely saturated. with yeah. that stuff, And it still is like, it, you know, and there's like, you know, man, you have no idea how many times I get hit up by people. I'm starting a YouTube channel. It's like, yeah, there's billions. There's billions. Like, you know, I don't. I I I do this as a labor of love. I don't make a a ton of money or anything. And and I mean, really, it it gets we. I I, st I do stuff, and then I get bored with it. So I do something else, and I get bored and do something else. You know, Nick and I are constantly bored, and so we constantly go. Well, now let's not do that anymore. Let's do something else. So that's the whole difference between us and people who want to do pedal reviews. I. I'll do reviews of something that lit me up and got me excited, but but I'm not gonna just sit there and do pedal reviews. I wanna I wanna just continue inspiring people to buy pedals in general. Just get into sound, yeah. and and I think that's really what it, or it, that's the gut of it. The gut of it is to just inspire. Same with the clinics. When we do these clinics, it's just about inspiring kids to make sounds and buy gear that's gonna get them a creative sound. You know, weird whatever unique something unique you know what i mean and then then we won't have to hear anymore we'll have to hear some some dude going crazy like, like nick you know what i mean yeah. we're trying to spawn baby nicks <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you guys are just creating stuff that is so you know far removed from the instrument that is you know oh, I mean, being sent in there the the new band i, I have with is called halo orbit we just we went to japan last month and you know i thought for months of how I was going to reproduce my sound and <clears throat> when I finally came to it which was literally like the week of our shows I it all came together I go two bass rigs one constantly runs subs whatever sub pedals I have but it's like a different configuration but it's constantly going to be on I'm never going to turn it off because you you notice it when you have all this low end and then you take it away people are going what's 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 where to go so it's on the entire time and then I have to design all the other pedals to complement it so it can't just be like that changed everything because I can't just think I'm just going for this one amp sound it's like this amp has to sound good next to the sub amp mm -hmm. so now it's a completely different ball game. So it was gnarly, but you know what? I think I could really help people with that. You know, like it, I, the, the, the mistakes or the things that don't work, like the things I spent a ton of time on and, and didn't come up with anything, but I, I, kill, I killed what I wanted to do. Like, I think it sounded great. And so now I'm just gonna work off that. It's gonna, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I if one day I have four rigs going at one time, cause it's all about trying to make it sound like a synth. You know, like a bass synth or a weird synth or something that's unlike, you know, of course I'll always do traditional bass, flat wound bass, whatever, fretless. I, I love that. I'm going to make a record where I don't use any effects. I mean, just because, not because I, because it's because I'm bored with effects. So I do, I go yeah. counter to it. But, you know, I, I, it's still like, it's just constantly striving to help trans, you know, keep the instrument relevant. Because I don't know if you noticed, but like, you watch television, you see all these pop acts, or you see, just go to festivals or whatever, you see less and less bass players. They're removing us, you know? Because the, there might be a guitar player because they want the rock element. And you'll see two synth players, and then you might see a drummer. Typically, you will see a drummer, even if he's not in the PA. The, the drummer is a thing that people want to see. But bass player, no, we can get rid of that. So I, no, get us back in there, make your instrument sound like the synths. Yeah as interesting as big or whatever and then you'll be cool 
I mean, so it's I, all about I, reinventing the instrument. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said this yesterday and I, I interviewed him, this guy, Simon Francis, who um, plays with Ellie Goulding, and I didn't know who she was, but she's giant, apparently. Mm -hmm. And she lets him rock crazy sounds, micro synths and, and sub pedals and distortions and fuzzes. And I go, she's cool with that? He goes, yeah, she's super cool with that. I'm like, props to her, but really, that's what's going to keep bass players in the game because there's no synth players who can get the sounds I'm getting. No way. No way. It's impossible at this point. I mean, unless they want to come in and model my sounds. But you know what I mean? It's not going to happen. So that's hopefully going to keep us relevant because otherwise we're my bass instrument's going to be the lute and nobody's going to know what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much yeah, for this one. Awesome. It's been a pleasure, man. Hey, good luck with your channel, man. Thank Pedal you. Zone.